One of the first things we did when we come together as a crew to learn to work together, I guess, is to design a patch. And um, we tried to capture all of the major events that are on the mission in our patch. This was our design. About three days before liftoff, we started out on a crystal clear cold morning on our trip from Houston to Florida. It was uh, a beautiful day, about 6.30. Just wanted to show you what it was like to roll down a dark runway. Feel the excitement as we started a 700 mile leg of what was ultimately a 3.7 million mile trip. And I can just remember the, the excitement in my heart, and the thrill to, to lift off of uh, the dark runway and pop up into the sunlit sky. As Dan mentioned, it was the start of what was uh, to turn out to be an incredible journey. And three days later, after we'd gotten to the Cape, uh, it was time for us to go to work. January 11th, shortly after midnight, uh, the crew started getting ready in the uh, suit-up room. Uh, here you see the pilot on the mission, Brent Jett, a Navy flyer, was here getting ready for his first flight. Koichi Wakata, whom you've met, uh, joins us from Japan uh, as a mission specialist. Here he is preparing for his uh, first mission as well. Uh, the other experienced space flyer on the mission, Dr. Leroy Chow. Uh, you can see Leroy was ready to go. He had a lot ahead of him. And he was very anxious. Winston Scott, Navy captain, who was going to be the flight engineer on the mission, also a future spacewalker along with Leroy. Uh, here he is in his preparation, setting up his uh, microphones and his comm carrier. Last and certainly not least, Dr. Dan Barry, another future spacewalker. And you can tell by the look in his eyes, he is ready to go. <laughs> <laughs> While we were getting ready, the vehicle was undergoing its final preparations. And then when we got to the launch minus three hour point, it was time for us to uh, depart the crew quarters where we'd been and walked out. We were greeted by many of our friends. Some of you are here today, and we appreciate you coming down to wish us well on our journey. We boarded the, uh, the crew astro van there for the 20 minute or so ride out to the launch pad to get ready for the ascent. And I believe this pretty much speaks for itself. Have a go for entry. Booster ignition and liftoff of Endeavour in pursuit of a Japanese satellite. Houston, that's controlling. One seven, one eight, and roll. Roll the program, Houston. Roger, roll, Endeavour. contrast to the uh, vibration and noise during first stage on the solid rocket boosters, uh, the ride during second stage on the main engines is uh, smooth all the way to Miko. Once on orbit, uh, we had to concentrate on our first major objective of the mission. That was the retrieval of the Japanese uh, Space Flyer Unit, or SFU satellite. Here you see a good shot of the SFU and it's with its solar arrays deployed. Uh, it was critical for these solar arrays to be retracted and latched prior to the SFU's retrieval. And as we closed inside of a half a mile of SFU, you can see Brian firing the jets, uh, primary RCS jets, to slow down Endeavour's closure rate on the satellite. Meanwhile, Koichi and Winston are in the front uh, cockpit, part of the cockpit, monitoring the solar array retraction, which didn't go very well. Due to the fact uh, that we didn't have latching indication of the solar array panels of the SFU, the Sagamihara Operation Center located in Japan sent commands to jettison the two solar arrays to safely return the SFU to Earth. Brian maneuvered the orbiter to a distance within the grapple range of the shuttle's robotic arm. And then I started <coughs> to maneuver the robotic arm to grapple the SFU. This is the moment of the capture of the SFU, and uh, this was the end of the 10-month voyage of the Space Flyer Unit since it had been launched by a Japanese H-2 rocket uh, last March. It's 
see Koichi uh, concentrating here as he gets ready to, to uh, berth the satellite. After grapple, the SFU was uh, maneuvered to, to be berthed in the payload bay. Looks like he's ready to slam dunk that one. <laughs> <laughs> And then orbiter's electrical power was supplied to the SFU's uh, heater system uh, through this electrical umbilical. And it was a great moment, excuse me, it was a great moment uh, to have accomplished the first of the many uh, objectives of this mission. Even though the space flight unit was our primary satellite, to deploy and retrieve a second satellite, the OST, was equally exciting. OST is the Office of Aeronautics and Space Technology Satellite. It consisted of four experiments which were really pretty much autonomous once we released it. And you can see Koichi uh, working the arm here. Actually, you can see the arm of Koichi is flying inside. He releases it, and it's going to go into uh, a pirouette maneuver to check its automatic uh, control system, its attitude control system. Now, when we were inside the shuttle, of course, we were thinking about how the satellite was going to perform, which is a very technical thing. It was only after I looked at the film afterward that I could reflect on really the majesty uh, of the satellite. And watch when the Earth comes into view at the lower left-hand side <coughs> as the satellite uh, does its turn. Then you're going to see the sunlight hit it again, reflecting off of its gold coating. I think it's really something. Brent's flying the orbiter. Koichi's working the arm. Dan's taking pictures. Everybody's pretty busy inside. But I tell you, it was really an exciting time. We're backing away from this thing. And again, you're going to see a nice view of the Earth below. Incidentally, this picture of this deployment took place over the Namibian desert in the southern part of the uh, African continent. And take a look at the clouds. Take a look at the synthetic object flying over the natural objects below. I think it was out of sight. Here we are getting ready for the first of two EVAs. <clears throat> Dan Barry is helping me getting into my lower torso assembly. And you can see that uh, in zero G, even getting in your EVA pants can be done two legs at a time. <laughs> And here we are about to come out on the first EVA. I'm uh, opening up the thermal cover and uh, taking my first peek outside. Uh, I was prepared for an awesome view, but <clears throat> I didn't expect to uh, really get uh, what, I, what I got, which was a big 3D perspective because of all the, the peripheral vision uh, effects coming in. Here, Dan saying, hey, let me out too. <laughs> on his feet. So you, you <laughs> <laughs> Here we are putting together the portable work platform, one of the major objectives of the first EVA. That'll be used in uh, future station build flights. And uh, here Dan is pass I'm passing up to Dan the portable uh, foot workstation stanchion. And he'll put that onto the arm. Here we've deployed the uh, rigid umbilical, which was another big piece of hardware that we were using. And you can see I'm handling this 250-pound mass pretty much uh, with, with no problems at all. I think that the essence of a successful EVA is, is really the same as, as what Brian mentioned for the rest of space flight. And that word is really teamwork, um, both uh, inside the, the bay with Leroy and I, and also with Brent and Koichi as they flew the arm, and also with Houston as we coordinated all the diff difficult tasks we had to do. Brent and Koichi were able to drive the arm to the place that Leroy and I needed to be at precisely the time that we needed to be there. This was really the high point of the mission for me, both figuratively and literally, as Koichi drove me on the arm up high above the payload bay for me to test some of the work platform uh, techniques that we uh, had, had practiced. Uh, the second rendezvous of the mission uh, to retrieve the OST satellite went extremely well. Uh, as we closed inside of 600 feet, uh, Endeavour was on a nearly perfect trajectory uh, to achieve the rendezvous. Brian, the commander, must have been feeling really comfortable about the whole thing. Um, he figures it's safe enough to even let his PLT fly for a little bit. <laughs> you notice the uh, expression on my face as I moved to the aft flight deck. Uh, it was a pretty exciting time for me to get a chance to fly the shuttle in uh, close proximity you know, to another spacecraft. Endeavour flies uh, extremely well. It's, it's, it's very stable. 
It flies even better than the simulators we have here at JSC. And very soon we were able to maneuver uh, OST within the grapple range of the robotic arm. The next view you're about to see is from the camera that's on the end of the robotic arm. It's the same view that Koichi is use, will use uh, to affect the capture of the satellite. And you'll watch, and once the satellite stabilizes, you'll see Koichi align the target on the satellite and then um, smoothly and quickly move in for the capture. And just like that, the man was two for two, and uh, <laughs> he very quickly had uh, two satellites uh, tucked safely in the payload bay. Now, EVA-2, like EVA-1, was six hours and 50-something minutes worth of hardware-intensive EVA. We were evaluating all kinds of tools and techniques that might be used in the uh, construction of a space station. Now, this looks like some kind of weird space exercise, but Actually, what I'm doing is imparting loads to the uh, task plate in which my feet are connected. <coughs> There's sensors in the bottom of that plate that will sense the loads and make recordings of that load's data. As I said, it was hardware intensive. We had electronic cuff checklists, power tools, rigid umbilicals, electrical fluid line connectors, uh, electrical connectors, fluid line connectors, improved helmet lights, you name it, we had it. We had stuff hanging off of us everywhere. We could set off metal detectors from orbit. <laughs> now, one of the highlights of this uh, EVA <coughs> was billed to be a thermal evaluation to test improvements to the suit, but it's time for the truth to come out. The truth is that I was a bad boy, and I was told to go stand in the corner. <laughs> so I stood in the corner and got cold all morning. I stood in the corner and got cold all afternoon. <laughs> and I stood in the corner and I got cold all night, and nobody would come out and play with me. <laughs> No, in all seriousness, the thermal evaluation worked extremely well, and I think we've got a good suit and ready to go build the space station. Here we are at the end of the second EVA, and while I wait for Winston to uh, button up his slide wire, I've kind of climbed up the bulkhead and taken a peek inside to see what the guys inside are doing. And here we are coming in and uh, closing up the thermal cover and getting ready for the repress for the last time. Need to give that thing a good slam. <laughs> After two rendezvous, a deploy, two successful EVAs, on flight day eight, we had some time to appreciate the beautiful views of the Earth, to take some film to bring back to show you all the depth of the colors and the, the beauty from, from our perspective. We also did some carefully controlled fluid dynamics experiments. <laughs> the commander said, you better get that and not make a mess of my orbiter. <laughs> Splattering coffee on the wall was an automatic airlock depress. <laughs> Guichi and I also had an opportunity to play the ancient oriental uh, game of Go, and uh, we brought this, this along with us, really, to symbolize connections between past and present and between Japan and the United States. We could also experience how our body reacts to different kinds of motions in microgravity. As you can see, my smile decreases as spin goes on. <laughs> Here's the master of karate, Winston Scott. Look how stable his motions are, even though his feet are not attached to the floor. <laughs> It's uh, customary in Japan to mark the beginning and end of a large project by filling in the eyes of a Daruma doll. We had already filled in the eye of this Daruma to start the project, and here Koichi and I are getting ready after the retrieval of the SFU to uh, mark the completion of the project. One of the hardest things to do is to say goodbye to a view like this when it's time to come home. Uh, we all took our last gazes, uh, closed the payload bay doors, got in our suits, got ready for the deorbit burn. We burned north of Australia. Uh, an hour later, we were right here, approaching uh, KSC runway 15. We touched down about 2.40 in the morning. I imagine we woke a few folks up there in Florida with the sonic booms as we came in. Uh, as soon as the mains were down, Brent put the drag chute out, and that, that's our major deceleration device uh, during the rollout. 
Uh, at about 60 knots, he jettisoned it here, and if you'll notice, it falls pretty much straight behind the orbiter, so there wasn't much crosswind that day. And as we roll down the runway, we have those uh, bright lights behind us. You no watch me searching for the uh, center line here as I watch the nose move left and right, because we were about two miles away from those lights, and it was starting to get dark down there. And it's real important that you stop on the center line. It's the most, <laughs> most important part of the mission. 